We are doing uh, in these weeks, as I anticipate my stepping down from the role of senior pastor and beginning the new adventure in the Engaged Church Network, uh, we are preaching some of those sermons that you have told me over the years are some of the more important ones and some of the ones that I want to make sure you good and well hear uh, before, uh, before I leave. And, uh, and this one on gifts is significant. Uh, the first Reformation gave the word back to the people. The second Reformation that we're in now gives ministry back to the people. Okay? So it's important that you get hold of this, uh, of this understanding that we all have gifts and all have a significant place to, uh, uh, part to play in the growth of God's kingdom and his church. Now, anytime you read uh, the scriptures, all of us put ourselves in a story somewhere. And over the years, most of us have, have grabbed hold of our favorite character. Uh, I, would, I would love to have been Paul uh, when the Philippian prison uh, walls fell down and the gates blew open. That must have been something to see. Wish I could have been there. I, w I wish I could have been David uh, when he took on Goliath, on and on. All of us have our favorites. You know my favorite one? You're going to laugh. It's the donkey. Now, hear me out. Hear me out. Before the triumphant entry, Jesus sends the disciples to get the donkey that he will ride into Jerusalem. He tells the disciples, if anybody tries to stop you, you simply say, the Lord has need of him. The Lord has need of him. Do you know that's the only time in Scripture that Jesus needed anything? It was when he called for that donkey. Yeah. Can you see that donkey walking by Peter and John? Yeah. He loves y'all. He needs me. <laughs> you know, the first part of the gospel is that you are loved. Second part of the gospel, what makes it whole, is you are needed. You are loved and you are needed according to Ephesians 4. Stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this passage together. Now, grace was given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to the people. But what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? And the one who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens to fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into the maturity with a statute measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, which is Christ. From him, the whole body is fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. And he gave gifts to his people. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. This was an important moment for the church in Ephesus. It is an important moment for us. So let us hear the word you gave to Paul as your word to us about how you have put us all together to build your church in this place. And we pray this in your name. Amen. One of the reasons that we love the book of Ephesians is that it's one of the more practical books that Paul gives us. It answers those everyday questions about how you get along in the world. It's as if the, the church in Ephesus had written Paul and said, okay, we're Christians, now what? 
And understand, Ephesus was not an easy place to be a Christian. Uh, in Acts, we're told that there was a riot that broke out when Paul began to preach because his preaching was so affected that it, uh, effective that it affected the local economy and the, and the sale of the silver statues of Diana. He barely got out of that city with his life. In fact, he writes to the Corinthians that while he was in Ephesus, he had to wrestle with the wild dogs. Now, we don't think he was in the arena or anything like that. We just think the opposition to Paul's message was that intense. So now he leaves behind this little band of believers and they're hanging in there to understand they're trying to make their faith work in Ephesus. So when you and I say, well, we're trying to work, uh, make our faith work in post everything America, understand the church has been here before. Okay, don't panic. We've been here before. So they write Paul a letter. How are we to be a church in Ephesus? How does that work? How can I be a believer? And Paul's response is, you can't all by yourself. You can't all by yourself. Now, I need to talk to a few of you. There are some of you who think you can do this without a body of believers around you. There are some of you who think that you are the Marlboro man for Jesus. And that what you need to do is ride out on the prairie, just you and your horse. It doesn't work that way. Sooner or later, life will get you. Life will ambush you. And I know you don't like the church, but when the bad guys come over the horizon, you sure want everybody around. That's the church. Now, I know. You come in here and you're going to love Jesus and hate the church. Okay? Every time I go to church, I just run into a bunch of hypocrites. How did you get in? <laughs> okay? I, I, it, you know, some of you, I'm just looking for the perfect church. Why? If you find it, they won't let you in. <laughs> this is what happens when you open the door and don't charge admission. Look at what walks in. And we are glad you he you're here. We need each other. We are given gifts. Now the image is a conquering Roman general coming down the main street of the empire, throwing gifts out to the crowds around him from the nations that he's conquered. What Paul is saying is that Jesus has done that same thing. Our Jesus who is victorious over death, who's victorious over the grave, who's victorious over all the powers of evil, has plundered those powers and now restores those gifts to his people in celebration of his victory. Point number one, everyone has a gift. All of you are important and needed to the body for your particular place. All of you have a gift. No gift is more important than the other. Okay? Now, I, you hear me make jokes all the time about loving the nerds of Brentwood Baptist Church because we've got, we've got incredible people running our website, social media, all of that. We've got great technicians that make sure the lights work and, and the sound works. Okay? I may have the gift of preaching, but I am not very good in the dark with no microphone. Their gifts matter. Okay? Every gift matters. Not one gift is more important than the other. They all work together. All of you have a gift. Now, for you to sit there and say, I don't have a gift, is a clear denial of Scripture. All of you do. Well, I don't know what my gift is. You probably don't. Because it comes easily. It's a gift. Now, we have this American brand of Christianity where we have to earn it. If I work hard enough and if I get enough Jesus points, he'll give me something nice. And you can change in, right? And I was a little Southern Baptist, Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, Wednesday night church. Jesus owes me. Right? That's the way you think. 
All right, I have behaved myself. Give me something good. Okay, no. Uh-uh. It's gift. Here, I want you to have this. Gift. It's yours. Didn't cost you anything. Because it's gift, it comes naturally. It comes easily. Right? You know the musicians we have in the church. This is Nashville. David Hamilton's one of the premier musicians of, 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 of this city. And, and I'll hear him do something on the piano, and I'll be sitting over there, and I will be moved deeply. And I will find David and say, that was an incredible moment. I can't tell you what it did to me. And he, you know what he'll say? Anybody can do that. No, they can't. gift. Okay? A few weeks ago, the first time we did this practice of how you pray with anxiety and how you learn to do that with thanksgiving that turns the anxiety into eagerness, the team comes back to me and goes, where did you find that? Man, that was good. Where did you find that? I said, it's in the text. No, 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 really. Where did you? It's in the text. Read the text. How can you read that passage and not understand that the anxiety is overcome by gratitude that changes the anxiety to eagerness? And they all look at me like I'm speaking a foreign language. That's my gift. All of us have gifts. All of us are needed. That's why you need brothers and sisters around you to share your gift with you, to look at you and say, you know, you're pretty good at this. You need to pay attention to that. You're pretty good at this. We saw you do this. You shine at this. You need to pay attention to that because that's the way God tells you how you are gifted. It's when another brother or sister tells you you're good at this. We need you here. Now, no one has all the gifts. We are created to need each other. No one has all the gifts. You may have two, you may have three, you may have one, but no one has all of them. There is something about all of us together, as diverse as we are, working together for the kingdom of God, there's something about that diversity that celebrates the vastness of God, and the glory of God, in a way that one person alone cannot. You know about our musicians, they're all great. You put them all together like we did this morning, you can barely stay in the building, okay? It's together that you make that difference. Now, we received our audit, our annual audit that we do every year by an outside accounting firm. For about the 20th year straight, our audit was squeaky clean. Every year the auditors leave and say, will you teach other churches how to keep your books? On the back page of that audit in the summary, it celebrates that Brentwood Baptist Church is debt free. We just opened our ninth campus in Columbus, uh, in Columbia, and now we are debt free. That's pretty cool. Now. And now, I, I know you want to say, man, that's some outstanding leadership, Mike. <laughs> and I want you to say that. <laughs> However, I was at the meeting when it happened. Okay? Chair of our finance committee at the time was a guy named Bill Kenny, who looked at us and said, we don't know where we're going to build, how we're going to build, what we're going to build, when we're going to build. We know we're going to build. So we started paying for it long before we ever left 409. We didn't have a building campaign. We didn't say anything about it. We just put a 2%. He called it the debt wedge. Started at 2%, and every year he would move it up just a little bit. So after 10, 15 years, we had $2.5 million in our budget. You never knew it because we never, we never told you, you can't do this because we're paying off something. We, we never told you that. And when we paid this building off, 
we had a two and a half million dollar windfall for ministry because I was at the meeting when Bill suggested that and I was sitting there and here's my leadership okay we're gonna start paying okay Bill I like that idea that's a really good idea let's do that <laughs> one of the most significant prophetic moments in our church was made by an accountant. <laughs> Not me, an accountant. Now, some of you are downplaying your gift because it's not this time. Let me tell you something. Do you know what happens when a parent brings the first baby to church. Now, it's the first baby. Second, third baby, they'll throw off at the curb. They don't care. <laughs> first baby. First baby, we have to pass a military inspection. Is this room clean? Is this room sanitized? Who will touch my child? Have you verified them? Have you validated? Have you done the background check? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And the difference that happens when that mother hands this child to someone who is gifted in preschool. I'll see him a little later in the foyer and the husband will walk up and say, hey, looks like we're gonna join your church. Really? Well, what made the decision? We drove by here the other day and the little man jumped up and goes, hey, there's my church. Wasn't me. Preschool. We took Craig to kindergarten and met his kindergarten teacher, Miss Elizabeth Basenbox. We're all sitting there in these little bitty chairs <laughs> and she floats into the room all lace and flowers. Oh, I have so wanted to meet you all summer. I've been dreaming about this moment. I can't wait to meet. I'm in the back about to throw up. Going, oh, gosh, this is, this is awful. We need to get started today, and I want to meet all of But one of our special, special little girls has a birthday, and we had to eat cake with a kid I didn't even know. Craig loved Miss Basenbach. Genetically modified to work with preschoolers. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. Everybody has a gift. And there'll be a time when your gift will be the only gift that is needed. So find your gift. Disciple your gift. Because we are in a different, different time in the life of the church. Did you notice the comma? Works of ministry to train the members, comma, for the works of the ministry. There's no comma in the Greek to train the members, to train the body for the works of ministry. My job is to create in you the opportunity for you to use your gift. It's not to do the ministry. The ministry is now being returned to you. And you're going to be the one who reaches your neighborhood, to reaches your cul-de-sac, who prays for the people that you work for. And that's where the church is going to refine itself, is in these small tough, little naughty groups of believers. It's where the church has always thrived. And we're going to do it again. When you understand that you're gifted and called to do that. And when we release you to do that. Several years ago, the deacons, uh, this is when I first got here, the deacons were, uh, were, were refocusing their ministry. And they decided that they would do the pastoral care element of our church, which meant hospital visits. 
And so they told me, we're going to the hospital. You don't need to. Well, I'm a highly trained professional in hospital visitation. <laughs> you can't tell me I can't go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital. i tell you a very true story. I walk into the lobby of Vanderbilt Hospital. I'm back by the elevators when I run into the chairman of the deacons and the vice chairman of the deacons at that time who pushed me up against the wall like I was being arrested. <laughs> Bam! Both of them got in my face when the chair of the deacon said to me, let's get this straight. When we're here, you're not. If you're here, we're not. Now, which way do you want this to go? You never saw me, guys. I'm out of here. You know our deacons make about 10,000 pastoral care contacts a year. Do you know that? You go home. You study the word. That's what we count on you to do. Now, you know that this church is set up to keep me away from things I don't do well. Okay, I'm not, I'm not around personnel committee. Why? Because I believe the best about everybody. Okay, that's great if you're a pastor. It's not great if you're a supervisor. I'm not around, I'm not around the money. Okay, uh, I know sometimes you'll hear about a preacher stealing money and all that. You come running here, can that happen here? The honest answer is no. All right, let me tell you. What has to happen for me to get any money out of this church? Here's what has to happen. One, I have to go to Angie, my executive assistant, and I say, Angie, I need a check for this. And she will look at me point blank and say, what is the account number? What do you want to charge this to? If I can't give her an account number, the answer is no. Okay, I can appeal that. I can go to Lisa Francisco, who is our business director of our church. Head accountant, who we lovingly call the minister of no. <laughs> and I can say, Lisa, can you? And she'll just look up at me and say, okay, I know your answer. I walk down the hall to Stan, executive pastor, Stan, what account number? How do you want to use this in the budget? What do you want to rearrange to take care of this new project you've got? There's another bright idea you've got. What do you want to do? Now, if I can't get it out of him, I can't appeal it. I can go to the finance team. I can go to the trustees. At last, I can come to you and appeal it to the floor of the church. By that time, I'll be too old <laughs> to do anything. The answer is no. That's not my gift. That's not where I belong. And I can't serve you doing what I don't do well. And you're smart enough to do that. Ezra. In the seventh chapter of Ezra, verse 10, Ezra writes that he decides to study God's law, to give his life to studying God's law, to obeying it, and to teaching it to God's people. You find out later why that is important. Nehemiah takes the people back to Jerusalem from Babylonian captivity. They've been in Babylonian captivity, the people know so long that they no longer know who they are. So Nehemiah calls for Ezra. Ezra stands in the middle of the people and reads the law that he has been studying all his life ready for that moment. They found their identity in the hearing of God's word. Now we're in an interesting transition right now. We're excited about Jay Strother coming to be the new pastor. I'm stepping into a new adventure. And all of you are going to want to take Jay out to dinner and lunch and get to know the new pastor. Leave him alone. You've got the rest of his life to get to know him. Leave him alone. The place he can best serve us is by himself in front of a blank wall with open scriptures in front of him. In deep prayer, seeking what God would have him tell his people.
and then you show up eagerly to hear him. Now, let me get on another pet peeve. Some of you walk in and you fold your arms and you stare up here at Travis and go, worship. Some of you look like your Russian judges at the Olympics. And I really expect you at the end of the sermon to hand up cards, nine, four, nine, three. Travis can't bring you worship. We can bring you a frame to put your worship on, but you have to bring your own worship. Your worship has to be, I am so excited about what I saw God do in this past week. I need to share it with God's people and I want to worship. And from that, I want to anticipate what God will do in the days ahead of me. I want to worship. Travis can't bring that to you. You have to bring that yourself. And that happens when you plug your gift into the moment that makes a kingdom difference. Amen. And you know, this is why I was born. So if you ask me who I want to be in the Bible, don't laugh when I tell you the donkey. It's wonderful to be loved, and you all are. Now hear the second part of that gospel. You're needed. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm not going to do anything to put you on the spot or embarrass you. I, but for some of you, it's the first time you've thought about that Christ does love you and that he desires a relationship with you and you don't know what to do with that. That's okay. Don't expect you to have it all worked out. We'll be waiting for you in the Welcome Center. Head out of here, turn left, and you'll see it. We'd love to have a few minutes to talk to you and get to know you a little better help you answer your questions so you can know the love of Christ today. I beg you, don't leave with those questions unanswered. Perhaps you won't be part of Brentwood Baptist Church, man. We'd love to have you part of what God is doing in and through us. We'd love to help you find out how you're wired and the gifts you have and help you find a place that can make a difference. You come. Wherever you are, Christ is waiting for you where you are. The church will wait for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open before you, every heart. So we pray now the decisions we make are exactly what you want.